Last week we met Autopithecus cadaba, whose fossilized remains were discovered by Johannes Haley Selassie in 1997. The species was named in 2004 after more teeth were found. It was associated with another Artipithecus find that came earlier. Between 1992 and 1994, working in the Awash region of Ethiopia, the same region that Kadaba would be found a few years later, paleoanthropologist Tim White unearthed well over 100 specimens of something new. New in that we never knew about it before its discovery. The age of the remains representing around 35 individuals were old, dating back 4.4 million years. Remember, this was before Kadaba was found. It was even before Sahelanthropus chidensis and Aurorin tugenensis were found in the early 2000s. For White and his team, this new species represented an ancestor much older than any we knew of. Much older than Lucy, the famous Australopithecus afarensis skeleton found in 1974. There is grandeur in this view of life. Welcome to Evolution Talk with Rick Coast, an introduction to the oldest story ever told. So, what did Tim White name his new find? The name Artipithecus ramidus is based on an Afar name for ground, Arti, and ramid for root. And so if you want to think of it that way, it's kind of like the root of the ground apes. We in the Middle Awash Project try to respect the local culture by naming, when we can, the scientific name based on an Afar root. Artipithecus ramidus. <laughs> One of the specimens, a skeleton that is 50% complete, which is absolutely amazing, by the way, they nicknamed it Artie. Before Artie was found, Lucy had the spotlight. Lucy represented the earliest human ancestor that we knew of at the time. With Artie's arrival, Lucy now had to share the fame. It sort of reminds me of that old Hollywood movie, Sunset Boulevard. Norma Desmond, the film's antagonist, brilliantly played by Gloria Swanson in 1950, couldn't stand to be pushed aside and out of the spotlight. You see, this is my life. It always will be. There's nothing else. Just us. And the cameras. And those wonderful people out there in the dark. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Poor Lucy. I mean, Norma. Anyway, all that aside, what Artie displays, and this will sound familiar if you've been listening for the last few episodes, is a unique mix of ape-like traits seen in its predecessor, Kadaba, and the human-like traits of later hominins. What you don't see are any of the traits seen in modern-day chimpanzees or apes, and this is worth noting. We often imagine our earliest ancestors being much like a chimpanzee or an ape, hunched over and using its knuckles for stability and mobility. Even Charles Darwin warned against that image. His warning came well before we had any of the evidence that we have now. The closest he had to any fossil find of an earlier form of human were the Neanderthal bones found in the Neander Valley. At the time, there was still a lot of debate as to whether the Neanderthal remains were a different species or just a malformed human who suffered from some bone-disfiguring disease. Darwin knew, or at least he suspected, the evidence would someday come to light that our ancestors didn't resemble modern-day chimpanzees, but something much older, something that predated both our lineages. We must, however, acknowledge, as it seems to me, that man with all his noble qualities, with sympathy which feels for the most debased, with benevolence which extends not only to other men but to the humblest living creature, with his godlike intellect which has penetrated into the movements and constitution of the solar system, with all these exalted powers, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. And this is what we have with Ardi. By all accounts, 
and by accounts I mean her bones, Artie stood just shy of four feet tall and weighed about 110 pounds. Now when I say stood, I do mean to imply that Artie was bipedal, just like Artipithecus cadaba, who we believe was an ancestor of hers. With cadaba, we couldn't say with certainty that they were bipedal. We only had a toe bone suspected to be of the same species. Now, if you recall from the last episode, that toe bone was found 14 kilometers away from the rest of Kadaba's remains. With Artie, we have a full 50% of her remains to study. I'll say it again as I said it earlier. 50% is truly amazing. With Lucy, we have 40%. Now, I don't really want to make this a competition between the two. They are both equally important, with Lucy being, admittedly, the more famous early hominin yet found. To be fair, we actually have a nearly complete specimen of Australopithecus in one called Littlefoot, discovered in the mid-1990s. Anyway, I digress. Back to Artie. It wasn't like she was discovered and the team immediately published its assumptions about her. It took years of careful study and I'm sure some debate before publishing their findings in a October 2009 issue of Science. In total, 11 papers were published about Artie in that issue. The impact it all made was like taking a large rock and tossing it into a pond. We're still dealing with those ripples. How about some facts about Artie and why she's a very good contender for being an ancient ancestor on the line of ancestors that lead to us? Granted, there are differences, and there are many in fact, like the size of her brow ridge, the ridge of bone that's right above her eye sockets. It's a little bit bigger. I already said she was small, at least compared to us. Today's adult chimpanzees are roughly the same size and weight as Artie was, and her brain was four times smaller than ours about 200 to 350 cubic centimeters. Chimpanzees are around 400 cubic centimeters, while ours are around 1300 cubic centimeters. Now, I am somewhat averse to comparing Artie to chimpanzees, and I only do so for illustration purposes because it really helps to visualize her. But I don't want to go overboard or give the impression that she may have been an ancestor of today's chimpanzees. She has no traits that are found in modern day great apes, traits that are found in modern humans. And that's really one of the biggest lessons of Artipithecus, is that we can't just take a modern animal, like a chimp or a gorilla, and use it as a proxy for the last common ancestor. Chimps and gorillas have been evolving for six and seven million years too. And so what we're seeing here is something that we never could have predicted from either a modern human or a modern chimpanzee. The only way to learn about this creature is through the paleontological record. Again, that was Artie's discoverer, Tim White. Now, by the enamel of her molars, we also believe Artie's diet consisted of a soft, plant-based one, probably supplemented by insects for protein. She had large canines and also a jaw that pushed forward more than modern humans does. So, where did she spend most of her day? Now, I've already mentioned that she was bipedal. I'll get to why we know that in a moment she most likely spent a good part of her time in the trees, and she was almost certainly a very good tree climber. Her high shoulder bones, uh, high shoulders, long arms and long curved fingers indicate as much. And she was also perfectly suited to life in the trees and most likely walked on all fours along the branches. Now what about when she dropped to the ground? What then? Well, she walked. We believe her bipedalism was habitual, meaning it wasn't her primary mode of movement. But, because we have such a well-preserved specimen, we do see all the signs of an ancestor who had the ability to walk upright. The foramen magnum, the hole in the bottom of the skull which connects to her spinal column, that's perfectly placed for a bipedal animal. If she were more prone to being on all fours, her foramen magnum would be situated towards the back of the skull. Her hips and pelvis also support this. Her hip muscles were attached on the side, again a sign of bipedalism. Those muscles helped her keep her balance just as they do for, say, you and me. And then there's her big toe. Now take a moment and look at your feet. You see how all of your toes are aligned? They're all pointing in the same direction, being forward. Artie's is different. Her big toe points off to the side. It's very ape-like. It still enabled her to walk on two legs, but it also helped her walk along the branches of trees. 
Artie, it seems, is a mosaic of traits. She's a true enigma in many ways. She also turns much of what we thought all along about early bipedalism upside down. Whereas before, and by before I mean prior to the 2000s, the leading hypothesis was that bipedalism originated in the savanna. That an ancient ancestor living on the Hominin River ventured out of the trees and into the open savanna grasslands of Africa. There, the hypothesis goes, they evolved over time the ability to see over the tall grass to spot either predators or prey. Remember, if an adaptation allows the animal a small benefit that allows them to live long enough to reproduce, well that genetic anomaly, now a trait, is passed on. With Artie, it may be time to rethink the savanna hypothesis. Bipedalism may have started in the trees. That's how science proceeds. We make hypotheses, we test them with data, and sometimes they fail. And the hypothesis that the earliest bipeds evolved in a savanna habitat has now failed in the face of this new evidence. So where does Artie fit in our family's journey down the Hominin River? As we steer our canoes through bends and past tributaries, we can't help but wonder where those tributaries lead to. Who traveled down those tributaries making their own path and how far did they actually get? Did Artie continue on the main river that led to modern humans, or did she steer her canoe down a tributary that eventually came to an end? Another question that comes up all the time are those other rivers, those that run parallel to the Hominin River but split off a long time ago, as ours did, from the greater Hominid River. Those other two rivers, the Pan River that led to modern-day chimpanzees, and the Gorolini River, which led to today's gorillas, have their own bends and tributaries. The unfortunate thing is, we have yet to find evidence of their journey in the fossil record. There may be other rivers, lost rivers that long ago dried up, and they may have left no trace that they even ever existed. All we can do is keep looking. And avoid waterfalls, of course. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Evolution Talk. I'm Rick Coast, and if you find value in this show, and I really hope you do, please consider supporting it at evolutiontalk.com. This show does need your help. I still have a lot of plans for it, and I can only do so with your assistance. Share the show with your friends. At evolutiontalk.com, you'll find more information, recommended books and reading materials, and also ways to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. I hope your week is going well, and until next time, Please take care of yourself. Evolution Talk is a Rick Coast production.